Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Darcy Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter, of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Um, due to technology being um, not my friend today, I don't have my normal slides up because they're frozen on a different computer right now. So don't feel if you're used to our webcast and you normally see my slides, you're not supposed to be seeing them today. Um, so I just wanted to welcome you to today's webcast. Yep. The Power of, gir of Youth Girls Who Plan program. Lisbeth arrived. Hooray, we've, we've got her. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so anyway, welcome to the webcast. The sponsor for today's webcast is the Women in Planning Division. Um, head over to our webcast website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast for all of our upcoming sessions that you can register for. Um, we are actually booked all the way through December. Um, so be sure to check in. Um, not everything is posted and ready for registration. Um, I know all of our sessions for September are. Um, so be sure to head over there. You can also head over there for uh, the title and the event number of today's session. Uh, so that you can log your CM credits. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. We are recording this session and we will post it on our YouTube channel as well. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, just search Planning Webcast and we'll, we'll pop up along with our well over 350 sessions. So be sure to subscribe to our channel so you get notified when we have new sessions up and available. We will also have a PDF copy of the slide deck available at the end of today's presentation, again, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Uh, if you're having any technical issues, you can type those in your chat box. I'll do my best to help you, but I might be asking you for technical help apparently today. Um, and for your content questions related to today's presentation, again, just type those in the chat box. If it's for a particular panelist, uh, it would help me out if you, if you said who you want to answer the question. That just helps me during the Q&A. So type your questions in as you think of them. We'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Um, and I think that's it. We're also going to have some interactive polls. I love webcasts with polls, so make sure that you hang tight on the screen with us uh, so that you can participate in those. So I think that's it for my housekeeping items. Again, as you think of questions, just type them in the chat box. We'll get to those at the end. And uh, I am going to hand things over to Caitlin to uh, introduce today's session. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. My name is Caitlin Wentz. I'm the Director of Programs for the APA Women in Planning Division. And today I would like to introduce our panel of speakers that we have for YEP Youth Engagement Planning Girls Who Plan program. Um, and so first we have Corinne Wendell, AICP, who is the founder and the executive director for YEP Youth Engagement Planning, as well as the director of community development for the city of Little Canada and chair of the, A of the APA Women in Planning Division with over 15 years of youth engagement experience. Corinne founded YEP Youth Engagement Planning, a 501c3 nonprofit that provides award-winning programs, educational materials, events, and supplies so others don't have to recreate the wheel. YEP provides proven programs for schools, youth organizations, practitioners, and communities. Corinne holds a Bachelor's of Science in Architecture and a Master's of City and Regional Planning from The Ohio State University. Uh, our next speaker is um, Anna Laborn, and as the Director of Collaboration for YEP, as well as a Principal at Design Workshop and Urban Design Planning and Landscape Architecture Firm with offices in Aspen, Colorado, and five other cities. Anna's diverse experience in community, regional, and land planning is united by a focus uh, on people and the planet. She forges application of natural and social sciences for projects such as park, open space, master plan, transportation infrastructure, urban design, resilient community plans, and development proposals. Anna specializes in establishing innovative processes for public engagement and has a reputation for her commitment to building equity for underserved populations through participatory design shaping physical environments. The power of youth to share a different perspective, envision possibilities, and be champions of change is a force she seeks to instill in the profession and communities. Our next speaker is Lisbeth tibbetts -Nutz. Uh, Lisbeth is the Director of Curriculum and Program Development for YEP um, 
as well as the Manager of Communications, Research, and Education for 128 Business Council. In this role, Lisbeth develops uh, and exec executes <laughs> major data collection projects, both to analyze currently provided services and to analyze broader regional transportation needs and opportunities. She also develops educational modules for staff, members, member organizations and the public, oversees all public-facing communications and design across multiple communication channels, and manages many of 128 Business Council's uh, consulting projects. Our next speaker is Lauren Trice. Lauren is the Director of Development for YEP, as well as a passionate planner and architectural historian with experience across the country. She has managed a million dollar grant program, led current planning projects, and developed award-winning strategies for community engagement. Lauren's road to being an urban planner started when she went on a fourth grade field trip to a local house museum. Her experience giving tours of old houses grew into a love for the built environment. Lauren is eager to explore how people of all ages define their community and decide what is important to keep. She believes in giving youth a voice in the planning process and opening the door to the planning profession for all students. Lauren holds a BA in Historic Preservation from the University of Mary Washington and a Master's in Urban Planning from the University of Pennsylvania. As a leader of the American Planning Association, Lauren currently serves on the Executive Committee for the Urban Design and Preservation Division. And finally, our last speaker today is Shrada Nakarni. Um, Shrada is a PhD candidate um, in the program of urban systems jointly offered by Rutgers University Newark and New Jersey Institute of Technology. Her background is in architecture, urban planning, and urban design. She's demonstrated work experience in local planning, architectural design, urban research, international development, administration, and academia. Shrada is actively involved in activities of nonprofit organizations in the United States and India. She promotes environmental protection, urban gardening, responsible consumption, uh, decent quality of life for rural and marginalized communities, alternative economies, holistic well-being of children, access to education and public health, and animal welfare. With a strong passion in school education, she currently teaches mathematics to middle school students at an after-school enrichment program, Russian School of Mathematics. As APA Urban Design and Preservation Division Fellow, uh, and in conjunction with YEP, Youth Engagement Planning, Shrada is providing academic service towards building future leaders in the areas of urban planning and civic engagement. She is integrating her knowledge of urban planning and design along with her skills in school education to develop a junior planner program school curriculum for grades five to eight. So those are our speakers for today. Um, we're very excited that you all are here with us and I'm going to pass it back to Christine to start up some polling questions for us. Christine, you're muted. Thank you. I am going to launch our first poll. Wonderful. Okay. Have you been involved with the planning or execution of a community event that involved young people? Um, and some folks, um, if you're on a, a mobile device, sometimes the polling options don't um, come up. So if not, you can always uh, chat them in, in the chat box if you like. We'll give it one more second here, and then I'll close the poll and show the results so we can all see who's on the line. And Okay, let me close them and share the results. Wow, look at that. 61% say yes, and 39% uh, no. So I'll go ahead and hide that one. And our next question, we have six of them here. Okay, that one is up here. Have you led or attended a town meeting at which youth were in attendance? A few more seconds. Okay. 
Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and close it and show those results. Pretty close. 51% say yes, 49% say no. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead on to our next polling question. I apologize, I have an extra have in there. Have you explicitly incorporated youth into your planning process? And if so, tell us more in the comments. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close that and show these results. 66% say no, and 34% say yes, we have. Okay, all right, next poll. Launching that one. Have you taught planning in schools? Tell us about your lesson plans in the comments. Doing another moment here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it down and um, share these results. Um, honestly, I, I'm surprised that it's almost 20% saying yes. I, I don't know, I to me personally, I guess I think that's a pretty good number. 81% uh, saying no haven't taught planning um, in schools. But if you have, for sure, you know, make sure you go into those comments and show uh, or and let us know how those, what those lesson plans were like. Okay, we have two more. This one, how many of you uh, would like to provide input and comments for our newest junior planning program? Um, and if, if you select yes, um, we will, we will, of course, get you information on that. I'll give it one more second. Okay, and then our last question here. Okay, so what's your primary challenge or barrier to youth engagement? So we're asking you to just select one, time constraints, lack of experience working with youth, um, just not part of my job description, lack of support from your superior or city officials, or not knowing how to get started. And if there's anything that's not on this list, please put it in the comments. Got one more second here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close it down and I'll show share these results. Okay, so uh, primary challenges or barriers for youth engagement, 29% say time constraints, 13% lack, lack of experience working with youth, 22% not part of the job description, 11% percent lack of support, 26 percent not knowing how to get started. Um, so that's where we're at. This was great. I, I just love doing these polls just to kind of get a flavor of who's on the line. So I'm going to go ahead and close that down. And uh, Corinne, the presentation is back over to you. All right, great. And I think we will. Does everyone see that advance? What, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll get back started. Thank you all so much. I just want to 
you know, really invite everyone into this, you know, discussion that we're having today. Um, this is probably one of my favorite topics um, in planning. Um, there are many uh, to choose from, but youth engagement is really just such a top priority um, for for what you know we do as an organization, um, and then what we would love to have happen in our profession. So, um, again, I'm uh, Corinne Wendell, founder of uh, Yep Youth Engagement Planning, um, and we have such a great panel today to really kind of discuss a lot of those questions um, that we put forward in the beginning um, to kind of gauge where you are, and then to help you kind of get to that next you know stage. Um, engaging youth, you know, in the planning process, um, going into schools and teaching youth. Um, and so YEP is really, it's a, an organization, a nonprofit that goes out into the schools and teaches kids K through 12 about planning. Um, and then also we encourage planners to incorporate youth in, into the planning process. So today's agenda, we're gonna go through several areas um, that will just equip you with more information, um, more tools and more resources to get you, you know, to that kind of next level to maybe add something that you haven't added before um, or to be able to go into a local school and, and teach kiddos about planning. Um, so we're gonna go over kind of what YEP is and what you know planning with youth um, and teaching youth looks like then you know why you know why should we plan with youth what uh, what are the benefits of that uh, then looking into teaching urban planning um, all the ways in which we've um, engaged with students across the country we're going to show some examples um, and some curriculum and methodology and then uh, we're going to kind of talk about what's next um, we've been working on areas of a girls who plan program with the women in planning division and then our junior planner program with our partnership with the urban design and preservation division and then we will um, have questions so at the end we'll leave a good amount of time for uh, for questions for the audience and so um, you know just to give a little more of an overview of what we do um, with our organization you know it's really been uh, 15 years in the making um, ever since I graduated uh, from grad school and um, we started kind of building uh, this organization to not only uh, encourage planning with youth, but also go into the schools to teach about youth. So we really are passionate about young people. We know they have that incredible excitement, positivity, that eternal optimism, um, contagious spirit. Um, they dream fearlessly when you interact with kids you get ideas that you never thought you know you could have because they don't have those barriers to you know what could go wrong what are all the challenges um, they really take it from a more creative perspective which we love um, and so they're naturally inquisitive you know they may ask questions that um, we really haven't um, encountered before um, and so they're helpful to others and more imaginative and so we realize that potential um, so it's been our mission to encourage young people to learn and create and participate in the world around them so in their own communities in their schools um, to talk to their parents about what's happening um, in their communities and we do that through um, education so we know that young people have the ability to play a meaningful role in creating vibrant communities. Uh, we do it through inspiration, um, expanding that opportunity um, to inspire youth to have a positive influence in the world around them, uh, participation. So we want youth to be a part of the conversation. So encouraging the participation in the public process, in the plan making, in being civic minded, and then also in our profession. So as you know, AICP or not, as a planner, you know, we really have that duty um, as a call to reach out to um, all backgrounds, all diverse neighborhoods that we have, all diverse communities um, to look for underserved um, areas um, um, and to bring them into the conversation. And so we also want to introduce um, our profession to youth at an early age. This is very important for us to ensure that we are continuing that pipeline, that we're um, you know, incorporating voices um, into what we do. And so that's why it's really important for not only our organization, but partnering with um, all kinds of other folks on, on this mission that we have. And so we do this through um, supporting volunteers. Um, so focusing on uh, grades K through 12, but not, and also young adults um, as well. And, and so this is something that we really wanna make sure that we can kind of spread the word on um, to get folks um, to be able to, to learn and to um, be excited about incorporating youth. And so what we do, we have events all across the country, um, engage with over 7,000 students um, so far. Um, we do even um, have sort of a young adult um, events that we do as well that we'll uh, talk about some of those examples in a little bit. 
Um, we love to partner with school districts. There's nothing better than maybe being a planner in a community or uh, for a consulting firm or an agency or organization and being able to have that relationship with your school district um, to go into the schools uh, to um, have teachers who you know love to come come back year after year to talk about urban planning. Um, and so we've also done a lot of um, AP National Conference events um, pre-COVID, um, hope to continue when we're in San Diego next year. Uh, we've done a lot of APA chapter conference events as well. Um, through uh, the Women in Planning Division, uh, we have been awarded um, an educational award for the Girls Who Plan program. And then we're gonna be getting into the details of this junior planner program coming up. We do have resources, so if you ever want to go to our webpage, um, you can look at our lesson plans and curriculum that we have up there. Uh, we do have our planner stay in school. It is customizable curriculum. I always have a lot of phone calls with planners asking how to adjust it for certain types of interactions, whether they're gonna, they're gonna be at a farmer's market or they're doing an open house, or maybe they're just going into the classroom. So how do we customize it for where we are in the community? And then uh, on the website, we have examples of how youth involvement in communities have impacted uh, where they are. We've, uh, we have different examples of youth master plans that have been created for different cities and communities. Uh, also where um, youth boards and commissions are. Um, and then also in the, um, also youth organizations. So there's many different um, types of organizations around um, the country. And then also our, our resources um, are definitely aligned with our mission. So we want these to be free and available for you to use um, so that you can go in and um, teach you know, youth and have that volunteering experience. You know, if you are AICP, you can self-report um, you know, CM credits, which is amazing. So that is something that you know, if you are interested in and wanna incorporate into what you do, a great time to do that actually is National Community Planning Month in October. So that is something that would be a really great start. Um, you have time, it's only August, um, to be able to reach out to the school district, to the teachers, um, and then begin you know, a planner stay in school. So now I'm gonna um, send it over to Lisbeth, who's gonna talk about kind of involving youth into the community. So Lisbeth, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Corinne. Um, so there are a lot of really good reasons to involve youth in planning. You know, it's good for them. I'm not gonna read it off, right off your slides because you know, you can download them. So th I view this more as color commentary, more just to warn you ahead of time. But um, it's good for them and it's good for you and it's good for your community, right? Kids, love to know how their world works and they love to be given opportunities to actually have power over that world. And this is this is an excellent way to do that in in a venue that isn't often offered up to them. But it's also really good for you. We all know that as planners, there are some communities that de facto end up being involved in the very beginning of the planning process and other communities that don't end up being involved until the end, right? The communities that you want to build relationships with, but those relationships don't already exist. And it's very hard often to go in, you know, once you've already planned something out and the community is viewing you with skepticism and try to build those relationships then, right? And But kids are a great inroad. In the short term, it, it's, it's a way to establish that you care, right? There's no way that shows that you care about a community more than spending time with their kids. And in the long term, you're building you're building up relationships with people who have then are going to grow up to be educated, you know, informed citizens ready to engage with you in return. So it's really, you know, on a very functional level, it's a really, really good idea if you're trying to diversify the, your community relations. And it's and it's really enriching for you as a planner. Um, let's see if we go, can we move forward to the next? Do I have control over this? Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so, you know, the kids are a huge part of just the actual census population. More than 20% of the population is kids. And so if you, is, you know, are minors. And so if you think about it, it's actually kind of criminal that we don't think more consistently about their engagement. If there were any other part of the community, right, that we said we're more than 20% of the population and we weren't intentionally engaging them on a regular basis, we would view them at, that as a huge problem. Um, 
and it's definitely worth the effort. So, you know, some basic principles that I keep in mind, some of the things that you have to put effort into, right, is uh, involve the age of your audience. The younger the audience, the more tactile the activities need to be versus the older the audience, the more time they're, they're gonna want from you for open reflection. So, you know, if you're dealing with somebody who's as old as a high school kid, they have, you know, they are discovering their power as a critical thinker at that age. You know, it's part of what makes teenagers such a joy and such a challenge is that they have lots and lots of, of thoughts and very well-informed feelings and they will shock you with how deep they are capable of going. And that's what they want to do with their time with an adult, right? Um, is exercise that power. Whereas with a, a kid, you know, a, a younger audience, it needs to be much more concrete, but even they will always impress you. You know, my, my four-year-old, Lo loves to be able to explain to strangers that they know what a windmill is for and how it, how, you know, and how it connects, uh, you know, how it connects to the power grid. She insists on calling it a windmill, but, um, you know, so, you know, younger audiences, you have to think very concrete. They want to be able to use their hands. They need to be able to use their bodies, but they will impress you with how detailed the knowledge that they're capable of taking in is. And then up at that older age, they will impress you with how much words they want, they can, they can give back to you. And then in those middle ages, what you're really thinking about is, you know, giving them the opportunity for goal setting, um, giving them the opportunity for problem solving, but keeping the parameters and the rules concrete uh, so that they don't go totally off track with it. You know, learning these things is takes effort. It takes critical reflection um, on your part, but it will also make you better at communicating with everyone. You know, in my day job, we have taken a lot of the things that we learned working with kids and then actually use those activities with adults because uh, it's a great way of disarming them. You know, to having adults play a game that you maybe originally thought was going to be for kids is a great way of getting them to think in a way that they wouldn't normally. So it'll make you a better planner all, all around. Next. I think I'm gonna hand this over. Hand it over to me. Hi, I'm Anna Leiborn with Design Workshop. And um, I am a principal of the firm and uh, we're a group of about 160 planners, urban designers, landscape architects, and economic strategists. Uh, and as our name Design Workshop implies, we foster a collaborative approach across professional disciplines, public and private sector, and also ages. Um, and if you weren't previously a believer in the value of youth engagement, I really hope you now even know more about that power of it from what Elizabeth just shared. Uh, but you may be wondering how to apply this thinking to planning projects that require a clear engagement process and outcomes for implementation. That's the starting place of many public planning projects. And having conducted projects for youth focus on a whole variety of project types in different municipalities, I'd advise that an engaging youth can mean many different things within projects. And it's really important to start by asking key questions like, what level of engagement are you seeking? What are your objectives for outcome of this engagement? And if you don't have those in mind, youth can see right through you. They wanna know how their involvement is gonna be used. Often we'll have uh, municipalities express desires about things like, we wanna hear the youth voice, or um, we wanna know if they will use this space that is being planned. And so the, knowing those objectives is really important. And every once in a while, we hear the desire to really empower youth to um, see, see and plan through. Um, and an example of, of youth kind of seeing through you in this is, you may have done this before yourselves of, um, I asked my six-year-old to draw me a picture of what he wanted to see for a plan that I'd been working on. And he drew a little map and, and put some icons on it. He was very disappointed when I was finishing up this project that his ideas weren't used. So I think that's a really important lesson in how we design the engagement of youth uh, in, in projects. So in thinking about that, I kind of outlined usually this spectrum of engagement, and it's very similar to other spectrums of engagement you see for like IEP2 and other in engagement processes. Uh, but I, I think starting at more of where do you gather um, input to the plan? Not necessarily even in involvement, but points of inspiration, research, consultation, collaboration, or deferring to youth. Um, 
And this is a toolbox. It's not like one is better than the other. It sometimes depends on your time frame, your ability to do engagement, the types of youth and their ages that are engaged. There's a whole variety of things that you would consider in which of these uh, you might be able to work in throughout the project duration. And I'd say at that very top of that spectrum, the inspiration or research efforts, um, there are certain inherent values in that. Um, it really, you would choose that if your project has very in goals that are very independent from youth's goals, your, your um, objectives are not necessarily completely aligned. Um, you're gonna maintain kind of more like loose connections to youth and not be involved at in all steps of the project. You're going to maintain as a planning group, a high level of control rather than passing that to youth. And um, the communication and level of trust is a bit lower in those first two steps, or those two, two parts of the spectrum. As you move through the spectrum, things increase, such as shared goals, uh, more interdependence on each other in developing this plan, delegation of power, uh, more frequent co communications, and higher levels of trust. So the next slide gives some thoughts about what this looks like in practice. Uh, so for inspiration and research, yes, you can go to the next slide, please. This looks like uh, a variety of things. You can draw inspiration from observing youth in a place, that those blue blocks you see of, of how do they rearrange things? How do they play? What are they, how are they moving through a space? It could be from observing a well-worn path uh, that's formed from their movement. You could also ask them for words to describe a place. You've probably seen engagements where you ask a youth to draw a picture and that often into, uh, appears in a plan as saying this was the picture of how youth described their community. Um, it, it could also be um, a photo, uh, creating a model or drawing something in a plan view, creating a photo collage. Um, it's all trying to understand things that inspire them or something that might inspire the plan that is based off of how they engage in a place. Now for research, um, there's a variety of ways to pull in research about youth into your work. So journals and research papers can help us learn things about how um, youth are encountering a place and what their, their planning needs are. For example, um, you could find out that uh, all genders spend an equal amount of time outdoors in parks until the average age of 11. And the research shows that at 11, that's when girls um, radically drop in the amount of time and with the ways they engage outdoors in those public spaces until they become mothers often. Um, it may also come from surveys. So I could talk with enthusiasm for days about lessons learned from conducting youth surveys and, and what their input has taught us, how, how they sometimes help um, conduct those surveys. Other things like site analysis conducted by youth bike and scavenger hunts um, help us to really understand how they see a place and start to begin that analysis. You can go to the next slide that shows the next parts of that spectrum, um, consultation, collaboration, and deferring to youth. So some of that analysis might blend into these ways of, of thinking that you might be, be learning from them in consultation about how they engage in a space for, through analysis. But I'd say that the collaboration is also asking them for their ideas, considering their input. Um, and in all of these steps, it really is about a bit more of teaching them about our profession as planners, and they can see how um, planners influence their worlds. So it's often sitting there and, and drawing with them and teaching them how to, to measure out um, a, block, a city block and what that means for walking distance. It can mean asking them to select images that go into the character images that later people are going to be putting dots next to and, and choosing from. Uh, work youth, uh, youth workbooks is another way often that you're asking some key questions and they're responding and that's your way of consulting with them. And more of a collaborative approach, um, it sometimes is really involving them in a project where they might sit on your project committee and, and influence the plan. They might really help with the um, outreach and engagement steps and that has been incredibly powerful in projects because Often when youth are the ones that are going out and asking others questions, they get not only different responses, but people will, are more willing often to talk to them or share different thoughts with them because they feel less judgment in that space with youth. Um, so that's been a really powerful uh, way in projects to um, have that voice be shared. Um, another is 
uh, potentially having them in more of a role where they hold power, that you're deferring to them for answers and for directing the plan. That might be like you see with this image of a youth council that um, it created a chapter in one of our plans for the city of Boulder that was really about how youth um, saw the vision forward for, uh, for the city. Or it could be in um, actually building something in the space, that they're part of that implementation of a plan. And that's another exciting way to see their involvement from beginning to end uh, in, a, in a planning process. So they're the ones that at the end might be choosing the paint color or um, redesigning the wayfinding. So that's what I have about uh, different project approaches and methodology. And now I'll turn it back over to our next panelist. All right, so now we're going to get into some examples um, of specific uh, engagement, uh, specific examples of youth engagement that we've done as an organization. Uh, this was one of our, this, this uh, example from New Orleans was one of our largest scale um, engagement activities that we've done where we actually took a group of planners from the National APA Conference to uh, the Boys and Girls Club of New Orleans, one of their locations, and first did, did a training, a very brief, you know, getting it, one to get their feet on the ground as quickly as possible, very, uh, very brief training with them on how to engage with youth. And then right while, once that we'd stuffed all the ideas in their heads, opened the doors and all the youth descended upon them, um, which was a lot of fun to watch. It was fun for the kids. I think it was really fun for the planners. I will say the vast majority of the planners who were involved in that training had never worked with youth before. Um, it really wasn't, a, it really is true that that answer of 20% of you having, having uh, done in, intentional youth programming before is very unusual. Um, and, you know, the activities, since we had an entire uh, Boys and Girls Club population uh, working with us, that was a variety of ages, it's a very large size group, and so we had, it, we had the activities divided into stations. Some of the stations were more appropriate for younger kids, some of them were more appropriate for older kids, but the kids themselves could kind of sort through it and decide what they found most compelling. Um, some of the examples that you can see here are on the bottom left, you'll see um, some middle school age students. Uh, th those were, looks like fifth through about uh, eighth grade, building a city with specific rules. They had to work together as a team to build a city with Lego pieces um, under specific constraints. And so that's kind of gets to that methodological idea about middle ages really needing rules, right? If you don't give them rules, they'll build you something chaotic and they'll really enjoy it, but they won't necessarily learn something. Right, so you kind of have to find a good balance between fun and total chaos. Um, and so they had specific rules. They were working together as a team, but they had to take turns and therefore anticipate what one another might want to do. And that's another example of an activity that we've actually taken. We initially designed for kids and we've actually taken and dealt with adults. We've added even more rules, but we make them, uh, the adults play specific roles and we, we take it and we've done it with um, town council groups, we've done it with planners, and we make them play roles that are not theirs. So for example, we've made a mayor uh, be the transportation planner, and the transportation planner had to be the mayor, um, and they had to build a le little Lego city together. So, you know, working with kids will always give you ideas that you aren't expecting um, that can work really well with adults also. Also at that event, uh, there were a variety of other activities like having kids draw out, uh, try to map out for themselves, build some spatial awareness around what their, their own communities look like, how far away are different um, recreational centers and, and things that they need in their daily life. Do they know how to navigate between them? Um, and even we, you know, something as simple as uh, word searches and crossword puzzles, which is something that we have up on the website that you're, you're welcome to take. We've designed uh, a batch of those that are at different age appropriateness um, actually are very popular. You know, we, I think as adults, we think of those as that kind of thing as busy work, but kids understand the power of words. They understand that you can't engage with something if you don't know what the words are to use. Um, and so those actually tend to be very popular with the kids, even though when we designed it, I think we thought of it as something to keep them busy in between other activities. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, out here in Massachusetts, a couple of us from YEP have gone out to the Winchester Public Schools actually several years in a row, and we've used them as a, as a testing group for a number of new activities. Um, 
On the right two thirds of the school, you'll see an activity that we designed for those middle grades, right? Uh, we did this with sixth and seventh graders. Um, so again, a problem solving activity with very specific rules. Uh, they were invited to actually design a transportation plan for their own school. So right in the center of that, that is a map of the area around their school um, and that the center is the school. And we mapped out what is a walking distance, what is a biking distance, um, and brainstormed what all of the other alternative forms of transportation that we would want to be encouraging people to do would be and tried to make a plan. Like if you are going to require people to carpool, what are the parameters of that? What might go wrong? What do you do about your instruments? You know, all of those things. And what was really fun about that is that their community was in the process of doing a um, green, uh, I think they called it a green plan. Um, and so the, their science teachers collected all of their plans and actually presented them on their behalf uh, to, the, to the committee, which was really neat. And then on the left, uh, these little pictures on the left are an example of an activity that we did with high school students, um, where again, we looked at the geography directly around their high school and talked a little bit about um, water runoff uh, as a form of pollution, since uh, they tend to know a lot about, by that age, um, air pollution, but they don't think as much about other forms of pollution. So we actually looked at the bridge running right along uh, their school and different ways that you could change the layout uh, to create natural barriers while also into uh, natural barriers against runoff uh, into the river while also integrating more types of, of transit options into the entrance to their school. And I think that's it for me. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. That is um, so great to see um, in terms of how we can engage with you know students in all different capacities um, from across the country um, and in different ways um, that really support um, their learning. And so what we're going to talk about a little bit now is um, a, more of the planner's day in school. So this is a lot of sort of the, the bread and butter of like going into the schools, teaching kids um, K through 12. Um, we've done this so many times that it is actually one of my favorite things to do. And then what we do from this curriculum is then we adapt it when we go into those larger events with 100 plus kids and we're doing 10 stations at a time. We really customize it for the event, for the um, type of kiddos that we're going to have, where they live. So we want to make sure that we are representing youth engagement in a way that they are really excited about planning, that they um, can have a little window into what we do, and then we can have a window into, you know, how they interact with their communities. So the Planner's Day in School um, is something that it really has um, a nice rhythm to it. Um, we are going to um, publish a how-to guide for this um, on the Women in Planning website as well as the YEP website. Um, it really is the nuts and bolts. How do I contact the teachers? What do I do three months out, two months out, one month out? Um, and so for the planner's day in school, going into the classroom, you're really giving an overview, a presentation. We have a PowerPoint that we provide to our planners um, and it really walks you through how to do this event. Um, so you're giving sort of the overview of all of the different types of planning. Um, you're doing that crossword puzzle or the uh, word searches with them. Um, in, um, in this case, uh, we rolled out a long roll of paper and uh, we did sort of a, a, you know, we are all connected um, activity where all the students had to draw their own communities and then they had to work with their neighbors to figure out how they're going to connect. Are they going to connect up through a waterway or a bike path? or a bridge um, and so that is something that's so fun because it's individual they have their own ideas but then also you have to work with others because in planning that is what we do we're um, kind of on, on top of the collaboration list um, in terms of professions and so it really is a fun um, experience um, sometimes I do six classrooms in one day um, that's really normal um, and so you have either 30 or 40 minutes per classroom um, I always try and do a lot during National Community Planning Month I always try and bring uh, classroom appropriate treats because that is amazing and the kids love it um, and so that's something that we really want to um, talk to planners about and you know having that experience is so valuable and I always feel like I get more out than what um, I put in so that is something that I always try and express to others then uh, we did an event uh, for the uh, APA Minnesota chapter uh, in Rochester during one of our um, chapter conferences. Um, and so we went to um, their Boys and Girls Club in Rochester and we had two different age groups. So upstairs, we had the older kids. So we had the fifth through eighth 
uh, grade uh, classrooms. And then downstairs, we had the younger kids. So we had the first grade through fourth grade. And so we divided and conquered. Um, so we had the um, we had different teams um, go with different um, groups uh, from YEP and from our planners here in Minnesota. And so they were able to um, do small groups with the older kids that were, like Elizabeth says, were directed. They had rules. They had to um, devise kind of land use plans for their community. Um, they had to kind of look at the challenges and opportunities um, in and around where they live. And then with the younger kids, we had three stations because we had about 50 kids. And so we gave them a little passport. So in the middle of the screen there, it's a little passport. And so they had to get through the different activities. They got a sticker, um, which kids love, of course. And so they felt accomplished. They felt like they had achieved something and they were able to learn new vocabulary. They were able to interact with planners. Uh, we had some of the local planners in Rochester come and talk about projects that are going on in and around their community. So when they saw construction signs or new buildings being built, they were able to give them more insight onto how that happened. How does that process happen in their community? So it was a really awesome event um, where we had such a fun time. Um, then at another uh, national conference uh, over in San Francisco, uh, we met up with the Girls Inc. Um, global organization. Um, we asked if we can come into their afternoon program and talk with the eighth grade girls who participate in Girls Inc., but they have never had an urban design or urban planning or any type of planning lesson. Um, and so uh, we were able to go in and have um, small group discussions about you know, what planning is um, and what we did we had a creative idea where they could build their own kind of sculptures um, out of found objects and then they would create kind of a site plan and then they would use those objects as kind of like public art into their um, site plan so that was something that we were really um, excited about and to you know kind of have that you know new information something that um, you know most kids have never heard of before that is even a profession then when we were in San Francisco during that national conference as well, um, we met up with the Larkin Street Youth Services. Um, so this is an organization uh, where youth 18 to 24 come to when they're experiencing homelessness. Um, and so we brought a group of planners um, that were attending the conference, um, similar to how we did the Boys and Girls Club in New Orleans. Um, but we came to talk about, you know, overall kind of challenges that they were experiencing in San Francisco, in their neighborhood, um, talking with kind of political officials um, having representation um, in food uh, insecurities into, um, you know, finding homes and, you know, transitioning out of homelessness. And so that is something that we really were passionate about and giving sort of the overview of, of planning really kind of laid um, the foundation for these great conversations that we had with the youth who were um, asked to be advocates and leaders in their space, in their community. And so we were able to partner with them um, and really help to kind of advance how they can be connected to more folks in um, the city and then how planning can play a role in that. And then also uh, we have talked about um, partnering with different organizations. And so we actually partnered um, several times now with the University of Minnesota. So they have um, capstone projects and we were selected, uh, YEP is an organization to work with um, a group of grad students. And we were actually approved for MPC 20 in Houston, but we all know uh, due to COVID, we were not, uh, go, we did not go. Um, and so we hadn't, uh, we wanted to work with the mayor's office there and uh, look at their strategic plan, which focused on children um, going into nature and having more um, kind of outdoor experiences. Um, and so the group of uh, Minnesota grad students uh, developed best practices for youth engagement and then provided us with some example, um, different types of curriculum uh, for this type of event. Um, but then we can also transition it into potentially being um, virtual or have it available to our planners. And so with that, um, they really talked about a lot of different really great um, baseline foundational researched um, best practices. Um, that have been really helpful um, to us. And so a lot of it is about what we've talked about so far um, in terms of engaging young people early. So we wanna make sure young people, they're involved early in the process of any activity um, and that they are kind of, you know, in the front line of, of how we explain a project or what's going on. Um, we also wanna establish those shared objectives um, and values um, and make sure that they, um, you know, they take 
the time to learn, you know, why they're there and what they're hoping to achieve. Um, we also um, establish the partnerships. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're either partnering with um, existing advisory groups or a youth serving organization. That's a great place to start or an existing um, classroom or school. Um, we wanna make sure that you're um, having, you know, maintaining that frequent contact um, and that you are also, um, you know, making use of their expertise. Um, Anna talked about that a lot, you know, giving value to who they are and what they bring to the table. Um, and then um, ensuring that maybe you can recruit young people um, into the planning process, being a part of maybe a planning commission, having a seat at the table um, is really valuable uh, for, for young people. And then also we wanna make sure that, you know, it's quality engagement. So there's structure, we talked about that. Um, there's clear objectives, um, you're supporting those relationships. Um, so whether it's staff or adults, you wanna honor the young people. You wanna make sure that, you know, that they're able to um, have successes or failures in the experience um, and, and be okay, you know, as a support um, to that. And then also um, making sure that there's opportunities for belonging and meaningful inclusion. Um, so you wanna make sure that, you know, beyond anything that you are making sure that they feel valued um, and integrated into the process. Um, and then also we wanna make sure that um, you're integrating, you know, what they're doing into maybe what's, you know, what's happening with their own families or in their school or in their community efforts to continue that conversation. And then you want to sustain that relationship. Um, so we want to report back to our young people. We want to let them know your input did this in the process and here are the outcomes. So give them that full circle. How did this become a part of what is going to happen? Maybe it's then in the implementation schedule and it's budgeted for and it's going to happen in the spring and they're going to be a part of you know, the groundbreaking. Um, that's really important to give them a visual of what is really going to happen. Um, and you wanna make sure that you can seek out future youth engagement opportunities. Um, so you wanna maybe bring them back for another type of project. Um, share the su success stories. You know, it got approved at city council. You know, we're able to, you know, finally make this project happen uh, with your help. Um, and also we know, um, especially with COVID, especially with, um, you know, children and families, sometimes there are trauma present. And so uh, this group researched um, different trauma sensitive activities uh, for kiddos um, to ensure that, you know, there's there's a lot going on, you know, kids bring, you know, there's a lot of emotion there um, and there's a lot of lived experience. Um, and so we want to make sure that um, our activities are content sensitive. Um, also that kids have choices. So if they're not ready to participate that day or for that activity, that's OK. You know, there's no uh, demand on that. Uh, we want to empower the students' ability to, you know, to engage when they are ready to engage. Um, we want to create space for just emotional expression um, and just recognizing that, you know, this is an opportunity for the students to express their feelings um, and, and give their um, insight. And then also we always want to establish inclusion. Um, we want to develop positive attitudes um, towards planning and the community around us. And then also we wanna make sure that we do have those culturally responsive activities. And so we wanna enhance meaning, um, providing you know, a challenging learning experience um, so that they're really thinking critically, they're being involved and they're you know, all in on, on, the, um, on the activities and sort of the engagement that you have. And then we wanna address you know, real world issues. Um, you know, if, there, if there's some uh, areas in the community that are of concern, you wanna make sure that you're able to kind of have open space um, to be able to uh, discuss that. And then also just wanna make sure that you know, we encourage, you know, you know, just making sure that the kids have a space to, to talk and to reflect um, and to, to be able to voice their opinions. Um, so this has been very helpful to our work and then also to be able to um, spread the word to others. Um, and so I'm gonna just talk about a little bit about what's happening next. Um, so we're gonna talk about the Girls Who Plan and then we're gonna go into our Junior Planner program, which is so exciting. Um, so Girls Who Plan, something that is a collaboration between Women in Planning and YEP. Um, and so we offer this to our members to have this how-to guide um, to go into the schools. Uh, we want to focus on the our equi equity initiative that we have in our work plan um, to introduce urban planning to girls in grades K through 12. Um, we want to expand and strengthen, you know, the presence of leadership in with women uh, in our profession, especially. 
Um, we do think that women and girls, you know, bring that unique perspective to our profession. Um, and so we want to reach back and teach that next generation about planning and how they can maybe become a planner and be more active in their communities. And so that's on our uh, Women in Planning website. Um, and then we'll have other tools available. Um, I put on there a little bit of that um, kind of um, the how-to guide, you know, what do I do, you know, to initiate um, the engagement? What do I do to contact the schools um, and kind of set it out in, in a time frame um, that's achievable? And so now we're going to move over to um, the junior planner program. So I'm going to uh, move it over to Lauren, who will be able to um, introduce this, and then Trata, who's been working on this project as well. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Trice. I'm the past chair of the Urban Design and Preservation Division, who's been partnering with YAP to develop a junior planner program. Um, this is for those 80% of you that have never been in the schools and are looking to uh, get out there and really get engaged, um, particularly with middle schoolers, what we've started off with here. And um, this junior plan year program is different from the planner's day in the school. Planner's day in the school is just one day. This is a nine week program to really get in there and explore different aspects of planning to give planners the words and the activities and the information that they need to engage with those uh, youth. Again, it's been created for fifth to eighth graders. Uh, but could be expanded in the future to elementary and high schoolers. Week one really is about an introduction to planning. And then we have seven different types of planning that are explored. Those are historic preservation, urban design, economic development, land use, housing, transportation, and environmental planning. And then the week nine is a wrap up week where we really talk about the path to planning, how you become an urban planner, the different types of planning you can go into, and then they would receive their official junior planner badge. All of this will be in a workbook um, available on the website. Again, it's in a pilot program right now. Um, we have been working with Shraddha, who is our fellow for the Urban Design and Preservation Division in partnership with yep, the Fellowship program uh, through the Urban Design and Preservation Division is how I got started um, being a leader in APA. And it is a financial support uh, for a student in college, or, um, particularly grad students, uh, to work with us on a particular project. So we're really lucky to have Sharad and Ed Carney here um, with us to talk about the work that she's been doing this summer as our fellow and her work on the junior planner program. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to there, um, to her so that she can go through it and then we'll have some time for questions. Thank you, Lauren. So let me give you a brief overview of the snippets of our junior planner workbook. The junior planner workbook is a guide to help planners teach about middle school, uh, to teach the middle school students about urban planning. So our workbook starts with a letter to the planner to thank the planner and to inform about the expectations from the junior planner program. Uh, the workbook has nine chapters, each for a weekly class. Every chapter starts with instructions for the planner that you can see on the left uh, regarding the objective of the class, the takeaway for the students and the preliminary preparations required, such as printing handouts, maps, et cetera. Uh, on the bottom, you can see supplies. It lists the supplies that the planner has to have ready to uh, teach the students, uh, like markers and you know maps and stuff like that. Uh, on the right, on the first page, you will see a brief introduction to the topic of that day. And the further pages delve deeper into the content of the topic. They'll have definitions and uh, more information about the type of planning uh, in a language that is better understood by uh, kids in middle school. Uh, on these pages, you will also see a separate call-out box that has a corresponding hands-on student activity where the students can work in class uh, to draw or to think 
or write about their opinions about that planning process, etc. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Karin. Thank you. In each chapter, there is also a section dedicated to the role and actions of the planner for that specific type of planning uh, so that students have a better idea of what goes on in the city halls and how uh, the planners are actively pursuing that kind of planning. And lastly, we conclude the chapter with discussion questions, which get students to think more analytically and talk constructively and collectively on their how and why questions about urban planning. Uh, the junior planner workbook uh, can be used with supplemental materials such as handouts uh, or slideshows. Each planner is welcome to come up with their own ideas about how to facilitate the class. Uh, the materials can also be customized according to the local scenarios uh, to get the students better acquainted with what's going on in their neighborhood or community. Some examples are available on the YEP website as well. And with that, I'll hand over to Corin to close the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Shraddha. And thank you, Lauren. This is really, um, this is almost a year in the making, I have to say. Um, and we have been responding to um, our teachers and to our planners of what can we do that's more than just the one classroom experience? What can we do? Um, maybe if we're not ready to do a giant event with maybe 100 kiddos, um, but we really want to do something, you know, kind of more long term. And our teachers said, can you come back next week? Can you come back? You know, I've had teachers who call me every year. I want to make sure that you're on my calendar <laughs> so you can come and teach my kiddos. It fits in so nicely with their curriculum. And it's also you know, obtainable and achievable, um, digestible. Um, it kind of spells it all out for you, which is amazing. Um, and it kind of gives that, you know, the lesson plan that is so informative um, for these kiddos. And like uh, Lauren and Shredda said, we're going to be um, kind of developing something for the younger kiddos. So the, you know, that K through four, and then also for the high schoolers. So the nine through 12. So we're gonna take this, um, take the input that we receive on it. Uh, we are still um, going through sort of the, um, kind of the um, feedback really we're doing our own kind of engagement process with it um, with our planners in these fields we're also going to our teachers um, you know does this make sense you know can you teach it um, if you didn't have a planner there maybe the teacher would like to to teach it themselves um, and so this is something that we are so excited about and uh, we'll have available um, for planners um, through our website and then also I know that um, through we'll be asking our divisions and chapters through APA to also promote it as well and so um, something that I think is um, definitely needed um, in terms of youth engagement and kind of like you know plants the seed you know you do this type of program or just a planners day in school and then maybe your comp plan comes around and you want to incorporate youth into your conference of planning so that's a great opportunity to just keep that relationship going and to be able to to uh, reach back to the youth for, for many different things um, and to you know, maintain that connection. And so um, you know, with that, we always uh, challenge our planners. You know, how you know, can you engage um, youth you know, in your planning work? Um, where can you teach planning in your community? How do you reach out um, into the different schools or maybe into the different organizations that you have? Um, if you're interested in providing input to us, um, you can contact us um, and uh, be a part of uh, that review team that looks at this program as we start to finalize it um, and roll it out. Um, and I think with that, um, uh, I think we're going to do questions. I do want to thank all of our panelists, though, for being um, so amazing and having such great um, depth and breadth of you know, your experience with youth engagement um, and also our partners with um, the Urban Design and Preservation Division and Women in Planning and YEP. Um, I just think that you know, it's been such a great um, collaboration. So we're so gr uh, grateful for that. Um, but yeah, I think we're ready for some questions. Uh, Christine, if you, if you have some. Yeah, we do. We have a ton of questions, a lot of comments. So if my panelists wouldn't mind 
putting their webcams back on just so that we can see your faces, that'd be great. Okay, um, so the first thing is um, a lot of these questions will get answered when I tell you to head over to youthengagementplanning.com. Um, <laughs> that's where all of the resources are, the contact information, um, all of the, the downloads, the crossword puzzles, the, the everything. Um, and you can uh, volunteer, you can donate, because I was just fiddling around on this website too. <laughs> you can even put your email in to get updated, get news and all that kind of good stuff, which I did. So uh, be sure to head over there and play around in there. Um, and it looks like you all are also on social media. I'm seeing Twitter, Insta, and Facebook. So be sure to seek them out in those social media avenues as well. Um, so I think the first, I think I'll do a couple questions, um, then I'll give you all a break and uh, I'll go over some of the responses of what some of our attendees have done um, back when, in the, when we started with the polling questions. We had a bunch of folks type in what they have done in terms of youth engagement as planners. Okay, but first let's just do a couple questions. And the one that's the most right now is regarding the caps. Chris, I think we're losing you. That will be a hard one. Can you can put it in the chat so we can uh, respond to it that way. Um, while Chris is working out some of her um, technical difficulties with the audio here, um, the question in the chat, which was originally posted, is for Corinne, and it says, is the best practices capstone project available on the YEP website, um, and could that link be shared with the attendees? Yes, so thank you for that question. So that is something we actually just uh, revamped our website so that we can hold even more content. And so that is something that uh, we are putting up on there probably um, uh, very soon. So I can um, have that available. So just check back with the website and uh, we would absolutely love to share that with you. Um, that was a great project with the University of Minnesota students. And so something that we would love to share out. So thank you for your interest. It sounds like the audio is still trying to play through. Um, and that is what is causing the delays right now. Um, I do not have access to any other questions in the chat, but I'm wondering. The, the if... University of Minnesota capstone class. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let's see if the audio is resolved. I don't believe it is. Um, okay. I hate to put the panelists on the spot, but are there any questions based on the presentation that we had today um, that we could um, pose to other panelists? I was not prepared to ask any questions. <laughs> I probably should have been. Um, Corinne, I could ask you a question about, I've just been curious about, I see 137 people on right now. What has been the response from planners? Um, where have you seen like a success in others taking this on? That's a great question, Anna, and I think I'm, everyone can hear me okay. Um, so what we've done is uh, we have, you know, really kind of, I don't, a lot of the promoting of this happens through our chapter, um, happens through, of course, you know, yep, in our, our channels as well. And so we've had really good response from planners who, once they kind of know that this is a thing that they can pick up and run with, it's very easy to then connect the dots. 
Um, some planners do have some hesitancy if they've never been in a classroom. Um, if you're if you're local to you know Minnesota, I always want to go with you know so invite me. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm happy to like you know get that first initial um, kind of jitters out of the way. I think a lot of planners just want to do the right thing and they want to say the right thing and they want to be all the things. Um, and so just you know just kind of I always say just kind of jump in. Um, you are the expert in what you know, and when you can talk to children about what you can do you could talk to anybody about planning and so we had such a positive response uh, we always get um, communication through our email and then over social media um, to be able to do a planner's day in school in their area so it's been um, wonderful and you know planners have been so excited to just kind of you know get started and then continue that in their in their communities i am here i am back can you hear me? Honestly, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, so I, I believe you all answered the question about the capstone and getting all those resources. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so another question that came through um, is, are, are there planning books available for kids uh, to get kids to think about planning uh, you know, in their community or just thinking about how communities work and function. Um, I was tooling around on the website and saw some books for high school plus, um, but there are a couple of questions about resources uh, just to get kids reading about it if, you know, if they can't do a full-fledged program or kind of a primer to a program. And does anyone have any specific examples? I know the ones that I read to my six-year-old son, <laughs> um, yeah. which is great. But Anna, why don't yeah, why don't you start, and then maybe we can all put our, same, our ideas. I was on the same thinking, Corinne. That um, I, I mean, there's a, a coloring book that um, APA has. Put, well, or no, it's a comic book thing that I've seen that is for engaging youth, and I forget the name of it. So someone else might remember it and be able to promote that one. Um, but there. I also think about that as for younger kids, sometimes it's about using other things that are in their lives, like the books they would normally read that have a message about planning. And I have a list of favorites from reading to my six-year-old that I've read to him over the years um, that certainly could share that. But uh, like one is called The Curious Garden, and it's about uh, greening within the city and, uh, and how youth can take part in that stewardship. Another is um, Sophia Valdez for Prez. That's a great one. So there's there's ones like that that I think for younger kids helps them get I, familiar with the ideas about planning, and then you can have a larger conversation with them. And I've used those in classroom settings as well with youth. Um, that some of them have, have even cute videos you can share. Elizabeth, do you have any specific ones you like? You're muted, I think. Yeah, there we go. But we'll all, as a society, get a hold of this at some point. Um, there are some great, like, it sort of obviously depends on the age. Uh, elementary school is dicey because their cognitive and language skills change so rapidly that you have to be very specific. Um, but I think one that is good kind of for all elementary school ages, because there aren't a lot of words, are um, any kind of uh, city pop-up book, lift the flat book. There's one um, that's called, I don't remember what the author is, but it's like see inside great cities mm -hmm. where there are, you know, you lift things up and it shows you what's underneath. And that's a great one for all different ages of elementary because you can ask them like, who knows what this is? Who knows how this is built? Do you think this is built before the building is put up or after the building is put up? You know, really, you know, you can kind of engage them at whatever level they are. Um, so that's always a good one. Anything that shows inside and anything that has a surprise element, um, you can play off of for all sorts of ages. Um, there's also that great classic, um, a is it a chair for, a chair for my mother? It has an orange cover. I, I'll think of it and put it into the, uh, put it into the chat, but there's, um, a great children's book about uh, a family that saves up to get their mother a new chair and then goes on the subway to pick it up. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a great one for talking about um, 
you know, what is an economy, <laughs> you know, at, at all sorts, whatever level the kid is capable of, you know, how do we get from place to place? How do you get what you need? You know, really foundational concepts um, are important at that age of, you know, why do some families have more stuff than others, you know, um, for younger ages, really foundational is good. So it doesn't have to be like, what is city planning per se? I wonder if those that, um, attending this session have suggestions of what they've read to their child and said, oh, this is about planning, actually. Um, I love when when others share those with me. So, Elizabeth, thank you. Those were I wrote down a list of some to pick yeah. up. I would also add um, Virginia Lee Burton's The Little House. Oh. And it was written in the 40s, but it is great for how cities develop over time. Um, and then you can also get into historic preservation with it as well. Also, mm -hmm. Tinyville Town Gets to Work, which is a newer book, but they do have an urban planner in it. Um, questionable about the role that they take on, but uh, I think it's interesting because they build a they build a new bridge and then they keep the old bridge and make it into a pedestrian bridge. So there's you know there's definitely stuff out there, but I think there there could be more. So, oh, last you know, stop think, on Market Street oh, is a good one. Also, sorry, I just oh, yeah. last stop on Market Street is an excellent <laughs> foundational I say, I city. I don't think we've done this before, but we should we yeah. will put a list of these on our website because <laughs> clearly we have so many good ones. And I want to add, it takes a village by Hillary Clinton. Um, mm -hmm. It's awesome. Uh, the street beneath my feet. It's like a book that opens like this, and it's like as long as your room, and it goes into the layers all the way to the core of the earth. <laughs> Um, which is amazing. And then Iggy Peck Architect, which I think is in the oh, same yeah. vein as Anna's. Um, yes. It is, but I would say Sophia Valdez, she's much more of a planner. She even works with the town clerk. She's a CP. Yeah. <laughs> so great. So, and I mean, don't be surprised if uh, Yep comes out with uh, our own children's book because we're right, <laughs> like, that is like the next step for us. So, <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> Oh, the street beneath my feet. I just Googled that and it looks so fun. <laughs> <laughs> These are great. Um, okay, so uh, next question. Do any of you have any experience with or recommendations for establishing a youth member for on a planning commission or city council? Anyone want to? Yeah, Anna, do you want to start? Sure, I can jump in. I've had a little bit of experience with that. And it's partly in hearing the conversations from youth who have boards of their own. And what role do they want to then have in other city um, functions? Because uh, sometimes serving on a parks board even, let alone city council, is hard on any individual to do. And I think sometimes youth get treated like you know, a little pat on your head. Good job, Timmy, for volunteering on this group and they just kind of don't necessarily take the input that strongly so it can be a bit challenging to create the right relationships there from what I've seen uh, but having sort of a um, youth advisor or ambassador committee of its own I've seen be even more effective because they can then um, kind of direct conversations to city council they can come into city council meetings and present share their thoughts in a different format um, so that interaction I found honestly to be a bit more positive, but I'm sure others have had, had experiences and perhaps in those situations you've seen some positive roles. Um, but some of the smaller boards, like if you have a bike ped committee, for example, can be that sort of um, stepping stone that maybe eventually city council makes some sense to get involved with. Yeah, I'll also add um, for the city of Little Canada, that is something that was part of our strategic plan initiative. So that's something that we are gonna be integrating um, this fall to have uh, a youth member on our planning commission and then a youth member on our parks and rec commission, um, something that we haven't had. And it'll be a high schooler, um, hopefully a two year term. And um, and then we'll you know kind of reach out to the schools and, um, and kind of just make sure that we can maintain uh, youth representation on, on both of those. But yeah, that's definitely critical, but you're right, Anna, it starts with, you know, are there existing youth you know, commissions or organizations um, that can be kind of a part of the process and more of sort of a, a partner, an equal partner? Thank you. 
Um, next question. So um, we, we talk about making sure that our youth are engaged. Um, how have you, uh, as YEP, talked about um, ensuring representation um, of youth within um, within uh, all types of neighborhoods, within all types of schools? Um, just looking at the diversity angle, the economic angle, making sure um, that kids, you know, across the spectrum have access to this type of programming. Because we're talking even at the uh, at the association, at the American Planning Association level, um, I, I think there's something like 10% of our planners identify as BIPOC. And it all kind of stems back to kids in school, wanting to go to college to become planners and how do we reach them as they're starting to make decisions about what they wanna be when they grow up. Um, so I know that APA at a national level is really looking at this as an opportunity. Um, so, so how do you, yep, how do you take this into consideration? Does anyone wanna jump in? I can. If um, so just as an overview, so this is sort of the, the like ingrained in our mission. This is kind of the why of why we even exist um, to be able to go into underserved communities um, and teach planning and uh, remove the barrier that we feel is there um, between youth and, you know, creating change. Um, and so, you know, even uh, making sure that all of our curriculum and lesson plans are available to all planners, you know, free, free of use. So we're, you know, kind of making sure that there are resources available, tools available. Um, when we do our events, um, we have done them all over the country and all varieties of neighborhoods um, with all types of children um, from different backgrounds, different different socioeconomical backgrounds. Um, and we have really embraced wanting to make sure that we are reaching as many students as possible. Um, sometimes, you know, we say, oh, we want to do an event. And they would say, well, how many kids, you know, would you like? I'm like, well, how many do you have? You know, and then if they say a thousand, it's a thousand. So that's what, you know, that's what we're going to do that day. And we don't want to leave anyone out um, of this conversation. And so I think it's just, you know, as we, you know, continue um, this mission and continue the teaching and continue teaching planners to bring youth into um, their planning processes, it'll just grow from there. Um, so it's being intentional and it's having um, that core mission from the start of, of the why. Why are we doing this? And I'd say it also goes back to your partnerships that um, you created partners with YMCA, Boys Club, a lot of organizations that serve youth that are diverse and have um, different understanding or, or needs within getting involved with planning. And I think that that's a key tenant of how to approach this as well to ensure greater equity in it. Um, I'd say things like career fairs as well. You can often, if you go to the schools that have greater diversity uh, in, in race and ethnicity and incomes, you're more likely to be able to have those conversations with those youth. I would just add also, you know, talking to the teachers and the principals themselves makes a huge difference. We've partnered out in Boston with a number of different organizations um, as co sponsors for larger events and um, one of the biggest ways that we've gotten a, a more diverse range of, of uh, you know, as you may or may not know, Boston has a huge uh, inequity issue in our schooling uh, from district to district between public and private. And one of the ways that we've um, very directly and very quickly in a number of the events that we've started becoming a part of uh, increase the diversity of the schools that were participating, they were like big open days, um, is by providing transportation. And that came straight out of, that came straight out of talking to the teach, either science teachers or principals at those schools of like, why are none of your students signing up? Well, none of them can get there. So then we got them a bus, you know, so, and it, but it's like the, the teachers know exactly how to get their students there. <laughs> so usually if you ask them, they will tell you. Um, yeah. I will say a big part of the, oh, uh, the junior planner program, um, particularly that last week that we have is really to emphasize that people come at planning from all different angles and from all different types of backgrounds. And you can do so many different things 
with a degree in planning and as a planner. So really trying to push not only to welcome so many people into the planning profession, but to show that it can be used for so many different things and the diversity within our profession. So I think that's really important as a focus for how this curriculum will work in the schools. I also wanna say, just speaking for the urban design and preservation division, we have been working with libraries too. So don't forget your libraries. They are a huge resource and have been doing an amazing job throughout the pandemic at getting information out there to, to kids. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also, I you know, could add in some of the planners in school that we've done, you know, in the high schools here in Minnesota, we've really reached out to some of the um, ESL classes. Uh, we made sure that we had translation um, and that we had someone in the classroom um, that could be sort of a, a partner with us um, in communication. Um, and then also sort of, um, you know, we really have a, a Kind of a, a social um, aspect to this as well where you know even when we work with the Larkin Street Youth Services you know we provided um, hygiene um, packages that we assembled before heading to um, their center and so we wanted to make sure um, as Elizabeth said who who is in need um, what are the needs how can we meet the needs with what we have um, as an organization, um, how can we be the hands and feet of those who help others, um, not only in teaching planning, but also, um, you know, different challenges that people are facing. Um, so there's definitely, um, you know, that just empathic um, piece of what we do too. You know, what what can we provide? Um, we always provide drinks and snacks at our events. We always provide, you know, what if, um, you know, kiddos are, you know, food insecure, you know, what if they haven't eaten that day? So, you know, how can we, we don't, you know, come at that in the front end, but we're bringing that with us. And we want that to be part of the experience um, that kids uh, have. Um, and we wanna have that lasting impression in, in what we're doing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we need to wrap up, it's already 2.30. There are still a ton of great questions. Um, and oh, you know what, we didn't, even, we didn't even talk about Legos and the ability of Legos to, you know, to tell the story through a child's eyes and just all things magnetiles and all that. I know we have them strewn across our house at any given time. Um, we're just going to need to do a follow-up webcast, I think, because the, these questions just keep on coming. And um, we definitely look forward. A lot of people are looking forward to your book list for children. Um, and uh, to all of those who typed in their comments about uh, what they have done, um, I am sending all of this, all yes. of the, the questions and the comments, I'm sending them to our panelists. So yes. they'll have your information and they'll have all of the comments um, that, that you had because there are some really great ideas in here. Um, this is really wonderful. And, uh, you know, thanks to all of you for putting this thing together for this, this, your website looks great. The whole concept, the free resources, everything is just simply laid out. Um, and uh, this is just a really great resource. So uh, thanks to all of you, to the Women in Planning Division, the Urban Design and Preservation Division. Thanks for hanging in with my random technology issues today. I appreciate your patience. Uh, again, this is recorded. We'll post it up onto our YouTube channel. We'll have the slide deck available also uh, on our, web, our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So again, thank you for joining us today to our panelists and to all of our attendees for engaging with us. We appreciate you. Everyone have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. Thank you. Bye.